Hello and welcome. We're glad you're viewing our gardening video today. It was created by the Walton County Master Gardener Extension Volunteers to serve as a companion resource for our Gardening with the MGs series of presentations presented at local libraries. Today, our video in our home gardening series will be Powerful Pollinators. When most people hear the word pollen, they think of allergies. A recent survey showed that three quarters of the visitors to a pollination exhibit related pollen to allergies, but did not recognize its role in plant reproduction. Both pollen and pollination are vital to the well-being of humans and are also an essential part of a healthy ecosystem. In the natural world, many trees and most grasses are wind pollinated. Wind pollinated plants include corn, oak, maple, birch, pecan, ragweed, grass, and pine, as you see in the picture. Many people allergic to pollen are often allergic to the plants that are pollinated by wind. While many grains we humans depend on for food are wind pollinated, over 75% of all flowering plants need animal pollinators. These animal pollinators include bees, butterflies, birds, beetles, and even bats. In the U.S., pollination is vital to agriculture. It plays a significant role in the production of more than 150 food crops, including apples, almonds, blueberries, cucumbers, soybeans, melons, plums, and squash. It does us well to remember that pollinators are responsible for one out of every three bites of food we eat. And if that doesn't impress you, we can always remember that chocolate depends on a pollinator. It's a small fly called a midge. What is pollination? Pollination is the movement of pollen containing the male genetic material from one flower to another of the same species. This transfer is necessary for the production of seeds and fruits and helps to ensure the genetic variability that is vital to healthy plant populations. Plants are either pollinated by wind, water, or through the actions of animals and insects. Plants that are pollinated primarily by wind produce small grains of pollen that can be easily carried some distance through the air. Because the movement of pollen from one flower to another by wind is somewhat haphazard, wind pollinated plants usually produce a lot of small pollen grains that can be easily carried in the wind. Just think of all that yellow dust all over your car in the spring. Yep, that's pollen from trees. Also, since they're not trying to attract animals to move the pollen, wind pollinated flowers tend to be small and drab. In contrast, animal pollinated plants have a mutually beneficial relationship with their animal pollinators. These pollinators include more than 100,000 varieties of insects like bees, moths, butterflies, beetles, flies, as well as 1,035 species of vertebrates including birds, mammals, and reptiles. Plants that provide some necessary resource, usually food in the form of the nectar or the pollen itself, and in the process of collecting that resource, the animal moves the pollen from flower to flower, so both sides benefit. Animal pollinated flowers also advertise themselves through color, shape, and scent, as you can see in our picture. Some insect pollinated flowers also have ultraviolet guides that are unseen by the human eye but readily discernible and attractive to insects. Every plant has special parts that help it make seeds. Pollination is defined as the transfer of the pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts. The male parts of the flower are collectively called the stamens. Each stamen is made of a slender elongated filament holding an anther at the tip. At the right time, the anther releases pollen grains 
that carry the male genetic material. The female parts of the flower are collectively called the pistil and are made of three parts, the ovary with the ovules, a stalk-like style, and a sticky stigma on the end. When a pollen grain lands on a receptive stigma, the pollen grains form a pollen tube which grows down the style to the ovary. Male genetic material passes down that pollen tube and fertilizes an ovule. The ovule becomes a seed and the surrounding ovary develops into the fruit. Pollinators visit flowers to collect pollen and nectar as food sources. Nectar is the carbohydrate source that gives pollinators energy and pollen is the protein source needed for growth. Flowers produce nectar that contains sugars, B vitamins, amino acids, lipids, and other organic materials. The flower petals, which are usually the most noticeable parts of the flowers, are designed to attract and provide landing platforms for insect and other pollinators. Take for instance our purple poppy mallow in the picture. The base of many of the petals contain nectaries, which produce the nectar. Since this desirable food source is tucked deep into the flower, a pollinator is coaxed into touching the flower's reproductive organs, thus getting pollen stuck to its body. The pollinator transfers the pollen when it visits the next flower to collect nectar and pollen. In addition, a few plants reward their pollinators with fatty oils, resin, or wax in the seed coatings, which provide other nutrients that they need to grow and produce. This flower, the purple poppy mallow, is one example of a flower that attracts many pollinators. The bees, animals, and birds like the nectar, the pollen, and the seeds. So we have one sweet flower that attracts three pollinators. Among insect pollinators, bees are especially efficient because they eat pollen and nectar exclusively and visit many flowers of the same species during a single trip. They have hairy bodies that easily pick up pollen grains, making pollen exchange or transfer possible. You could say that bees keep our economy humming. More than $15 billion a year in U.S. crops are pollinated by bees including many of those that we have named, like apples, berries, cantaloupes, cucumbers, squash, and watermelons. You might like to know that in the U.S., honeybees also produce about $150 million in honey annually. Now, let's take a closer look at a few of the more than 3,500 species of bees in the United States. One of the most important bees in the U.S., the honeybee, is actually native to Northern Europe. Honeybees were brought to the U.S. for the honey and the wax that they make. Honeybees are considered social bees and they live in hives or colonies that consist of a queen bee, worker bees, and drones. The queen and the worker bees are females, although only the queen can reproduce. The drones are males. Honeybees are used both for honey production as well as agricultural pollination. And the added value in the United States to agriculture from honeybee pollination is more than $15 billion annually. Since honeybee hives can be easily moved from one crop field or orchard to another, in Georgia, beehives are often rented to farmers to pollinate crops such as apples, blueberries, cucumbers, and watermelons. Honeybees are hairy. They are tan in color with varying degrees of orange on their abdomen. They carry pollen in pollen baskets located on their hind legs and it also sticks to their hairy bodies. They drink nectar, honey, and water through a long tube called a proboscis. Only the females can sting, but it is considered a suicide mission since the bee dies after a single sting. 
The only social bee native to North America is the bumblebee. The bumblebee lives in small colonies of up to 200 individual bees with a single queen, and they make their nests close to the ground. Only the queen lives through the winter, beginning the colony again in the spring. Bumblebees are large and very hairy, and their coloring is yellow and black. The wings are clear with black veins, as you see in the pictures. Bumblebees can collect pollen and nectar from plants difficult to get into, and therefore they are especially good pollinators of blueberry, tomato, eggplant, and pepper. Unlike honeybees, bumblebees can sting more than once, and they will aggressively defend their nests. Bumblebees have been known to chase nest invaders for long distances. Now let's talk about some of the solitary bees. The carpenter bee has a hairy head and thorax with no hair on the abdomen. Female carpenter bees are bluish black and can sting, while male carpenter bees are blonde or tan and cannot sting. Carpenter bees like to nest in wood like dead tree trunks, firewood, or any exposed wood on structures such as your deck or your front porch. They're over one inch long and is, can be as wide as your thumb. Some people ask, how do I tell the difference between a carpenter bee and a bumblebee? The carpenter bee is considered a Mack truck, while the bumblebee is more of a pickup truck, as you can see in that second picture. Also, since the carpenter bee has no hair on its abdomen, one instructor of mine referred to it as having a shiny hiney. Another solitary bee is the mason bee. The name mason bee comes from the female's habit of using mud or clay-like mud, just like a brick mason, to seal off individual cells where she has laid her egg. These native bees are solitary bees, which means they are not members of a hive, and therefore they're less susceptible to disease, pests, and insecticides than hive bees such as honeybees. Mason bees are very good at pollinating fruit trees, so much so that they are sometimes called orchard bees and they have been exported to Europe for the very purpose of pollinating commercial crops like pears, plums, blueberries, raspberries, and many of the flowers in the rose family. The mason bee is smaller than the honey bee, and its coloring is typically a metallic blue or blue-black uh, blue color. Unlike honey bees, mason bees are extremely gentle you have to work really hard to get a female mason bee to sting you. Here's one you may not have considered when thinking of pollinators, the flower fly. Flies are economically important pollinators of a number of ornamental annual flowers and bulbs. It's hairy, so it looks like a social bee or a wasp, but you'll notice that it only has one pair of wings. Bees have two pairs of wings. The antenna are short and are bristle-like on the ends. And thankfully, the flower fly cannot sting or bite. Now let's look at another significant pollinator species, birds. The most common pollinator bird species include hummingbirds, spider hunters, sunbirds, honey creepers, and honey eaters. Plants that make use of pollination by birds have, usually have very little scent, but have bright red, orange, or yellow flowers. 
bird-pollinated flowers usually produce copious amounts of nectar in order to attract and feed the birds, as well as having pollen that is usually large and sticky in order to cling to the feathers of the bird. Hummingbirds pollinate many varieties of native cactus in the Sonoran Desert and are considered a keystone species as a result. A keystone species is a plant or animal that plays a unique or crucial role in the way that an ecosystem functions. Without the keystone species, the ecosystem would be dramatically different or cease to exist altogether. While birds are not known for pollinating food growing crops, if it were not for birds, many plant species would be in danger of extinction. Take for example, in the forest of Patagonia, a hummingbird species called Cephanoides cephanoides pollinates on its own nearly 20% of the local woody flora. In fact, many plants in that area can only be pollinated by hummingbirds. So if these birds disappeared, the diversity of vegetation would decline and some species would possibly go extinct. Now, let's talk some more about hummingbirds. Truly an example of a powerful pollinator. The hummingbird has the largest brain, heart, energy output, and breast muscles in proportion to body size of any bird. Hummingbirds are important for pollinating flowers as well as for eating insects. Bright red, orange, and pink flowers are more visible to hummingbirds than are other colors. And if you want to attract hummingbirds, plant red tubular shaped flowers. The nests are usually only about one and a half inches in outer diameter and they will be used year after year. So be careful when you're pruning large shrubs. The eggs are half the size of a jelly bean. Now let's consider some other pollinators. Butterflies and moths are also effective pollinators. The larvae, also known as caterpillars, typically feed on the flowers, fruits, stems, and roots of their host plants. The adults feed on the nectar of the host plant and aids in the pollination of that plant. When a butterfly or moth visits a flower to eat nectar, tiny scales covering their bodies brush against the anthers and the pollen sticks to the scales. When the butterfly or moth visits the next flower, the pollen stuck to its scales brushes onto that flower's stigma. Adults are known as spurious pollinators because their food intake is not always necessary. And since each individual visits perhaps dozens of plant species, butterflies and moths are known as opportunistic pollinators. Of the many moth species that pollinate, the sphinx moth, shown in the picture, are considered some of the most efficient moth pollinators. Unfortunately, since most of the moth's pollinating activity takes place at dusk or at night, it's often difficult to observe. Let's talk some more about butterflies. Since butterflies are attractive and interesting to watch, we often create special gardens to attract them. We plant pink, purple, yellow, and orange flowers if we wish to attract butterflies. Butterflies are considered pollinators because every part of their thin body is covered in scales that can help collect and distribute pollen. They fly during the day when it's warm and you will notice them resting when they are folding their wings up over their body. Butterflies drink nectar through a long tube called a proboscis. Planting a moonlight or a fragrance garden is a sure way to attract another of our pollinators, the moths. Moths are attracted to light or white flowers that are open at night. 
because they're considered nocturnal pollinators. Like butterflies, every part of the moth's body is covered in scales. But unlike butterflies, they have a plump body. And moths spread their wings flat when resting. Let's talk about another nocturnal pollinator, bats. Bats are important pollinators. There are nearly 1,000 different species and they are responsible for pollinating cactus, bananas, cashews, peaches, avocados, mangoes, and other tropical fruits. In fact, nearly 300 species of fruit depend on bats for pollination, and the agave plant and the saguaro cactus are only pollinated by bats. Bats do their foraging at night and are attracted to white or light-colored flowers They visit the flowers and the pollen clings to their forehead as they reach into them with their long snout and their bristly tongue to get to the nectar. Here's another group of pollinators you may not have considered. Beetles. In fact, beetles make up the largest group of pollinating animals simply because there's so many of them. They are often the first insects to visit flowers and it they remain essential pollinators today, responsible for pollinating 88% of nearly 240,000 flowering plants around the world. Beetles will eat their way through the petals and other floral parts and are often considered garden and agricultural pests. One you, t you don't think of as a pest, though, is the lady beetle, sometimes called the ladybug. They're natural enemies of many insects that we consider pests. In fact, a single ladybug can eat as many as 5,000 aphids in its lifetime. Many beetle species eat pollen, so the plants they visit must produce a lot of pollen to make sure there's enough left over to pollinate the flower after the beetles are done. Beetles are attracted to flowers that are green or white, and usually have spicy, fruity, or even rancid, flesh-like odors. Most beetles do need a wide opening to get into the flower because they are clumsy flyers. Let's focus now on how to make your garden a good home for pollinators. Plant a variety of flowers that bloom at different times of the year choosing plants that will provide food, such as nectar and pollen, throughout the growing season. Do provide connectivity between the vegetation areas, creating corridors of perennial shrubs and trees to provide pollinators shelter and food as they move through the landscape. Remember, to survive, pollinators need more than just flowers as sources of pollen and nectar. They also need water, and they need bare ground for nesting and shelter and nesting materials. If in doubt, you can ask local resources to help you in your efforts. There's always the County Extension Office, many garden clubs, or native plant societies that provide information to gardeners. And to get good ideas, you can visit Regional Botanical Gardens and Arboretum. Probably the best thing that you can do when creating gardens for pollinators is to remember to restrict the use of pesticides and herbicides throughout your property. When considering the site for your pollinator garden. Remember, most pollinator plants want full sun and good soil that drains well. If your soil needs to be amended, most master gardeners will say, don't guess, do a soil test to learn the pH and fertility levels of the soil. And consider if you need to add tall plants to provide wind protection. Pollinator gardens can be a little plot planted with a few nectar flowers or a large garden planted 
with great arrays of diverse plants, nectar flowers for adult pollinators and food plants for their larvae. The good news is you get to decide the size and style of your pollinator garden. When thinking of the size, consider how much time do you have to spend and make your garden only as big as you can tend comfortably. When thinking of the style, ask yourself, do you want a dedicated pollinator garden or just some pollinator plants included where possible? Our picture shows a small, dedicated pollinator garden with rudbeckia and cardinal flowers. When planning your pollinator garden, it's time to consider the layouts, including the background area, the intermediate area, and the foreground area. In the background area, you may place foliage or hardscape, such as a fence or a rock wall, to provide a framework and backdrop, and also to act as wind protection. In the intermediate area, you will want to place mid-size or tall perennials or annuals as this is the focal point that draws the eye. You'll also want to plan for a sequence of blooms throughout the entire growing season. In the foreground area, which provides the boundary, you'll usually place your lower growing flowering plants or ground covers. Since the goal is to help pollinators find your garden in order to pollinate and to grow, there are some considerations that you'll want to remember. Cluster flowers and ornamental grasses when planning your design. Group plants together for visual impact. To appeal to the pollinator's eye, stands of flowers are better than single ones. Also, plant clusters lessen the flight time for all nectar and pollen gathering insects. From a design perspective, plant at least a half dozen of the same species together to avoid the salad bar effect. This is one of the secrets of a beautiful cottage garden look. Use fewer species in larger masses. One of this and one of that can look scattered and doesn't contribute to curb appeal either. You'll want to select fragrant and brightly colored flowers with enough varieties to ensure something will be blooming from spring to fall. This variety will attract more species of pollinators and keep them around the food supply longer. Plantings of tall and shorter plants satisfy pollinators as well as our own aesthetic eye. And don't forget about water sources. Water for the pollinators and water for your pollinator garden. In our picture we have a beautiful design that contains phlox, coreopsis, daisies, liatris, and probably many others. Here's a question for you. Do you like color? Well, so do pollinators. They come to gardens that have colorful flowers all year long. So plant lots of different colors in your pollinator garden. Plan to use reds, purples, yellows, and whites to attract the maximum number of pollinators. And plan to have blooms in those colors all year long. As we have said, hummingbirds like red plants. Many red plants have places for the hummingbird to stick its long beak to get nectar, such as this wild columbine, which has a trumpet shape. And here you see native honeysuckle, royal catchfly, and cardinal flower. All of these red flowers will attract hummingbirds to your pollinator garden. Bees and butterflies like pink, purple, and yellow flowers. 
Butterflies are also attracted to orange flowers. Asters come in pink and purple and they have flat yellow centers that pollinators like because this tells them where the pollen is found. Question, do you remember what kind of bee that might be? We typically think that white is for moths. In this picture, you see a mayapple plant. It only blooms in the spring and it has white or light colored flowers. Question, can you find the moth? There it is. It's hiding from creatures that come out at night to have a good meal. It's time to talk about specific plants to put in your pollinator garden. Here are some that are usually listed in the top 10 lists of annuals. Ageratum, Elysium, Cosmos, Helianthus or Sunflower, and Marigolds, followed by Mexican Sunflower, Pintas, Petunias, Lantana, and the ever-popular Zinnias. Because you want colorful flowers in your pollinator garden year after year, here's a list of the top 10 perennials you might want to consider adding. Use members in the Allium family, in the Aster family, Monarda family, also known as Bee Balm, Rudbeckia, also known as Black Eyed Susan, Asclepias tuberosa, also called the butterfly weed, and Lobelia cardinalis, also known as the cardinal flower. You might want to consider Echinacea, which is the cone flower, Coreopsis, Eupatorium, also known as Joe Pie weed, or Scabiosa, which is sometimes called the pincushion flower. I have my own pollinator garden, and let me share with you three of my personal favorites that I plant every year. The first is sunflower. It's a fast-growing annual, it's easy to grow, multi-purpose, and it's a bee magnet. Then there's zinnia, another fast-growing annual that's easy to grow, multi-purpose, and butterflies love it. And I always add more perennial daylilies. They are edible, they have numerous blooms, and they're relatively easy to grow. And as you can see from the picture, butterflies love this too. You may be wondering, what can you do now? Well, hopefully after watching this video, you will be inspired to create a pollinator-friendly garden habitat. You've learned how to design your garden so that there's a continuous succession of plants flowering from spring through fall. And maybe you'll even plant native, using plants that provide nectar for adults, plus food for insect larvae in the butterfly family, such as milkweed for monarchs. Think about selecting old-fashioned varieties of flowers, because breeding has caused some modern blooms the, call the hybrids, to lose their fragrance and or the nectar or pollen needed to attract and feed pollinators. Don't forget, install houses to attract bats and native bees. Please, if you don't do anything else, avoid pesticides. And if you feel you must use them, use the most selective and the least toxic ones and apply them at night when most pollinators aren't active. Remember, pollinators need more than nectar and pollen. Provide water for them without letting it become a mosquito breeding area. In order to do that, you'll want to refill containers daily or bury a shallow plant saucer to its rim in a very sunny area. Fill it with coarse pine bark or with stones 
and then to overflowing with water. And you can always share fun facts with others such as, did you know a tiny fly called a midge that's no bigger than a pinhead is responsible for the world's supply of chocolate? Or, one out of three mouthfuls we eat is delivered to us by pollinators. These came from Pollination Facts for Gardeners from pollinator.org. If you visit online at pollinator.org, you will learn that June 22nd through 28th of 2020 will be celebrated as Pollinator Week. Here in Georgia, let's get ready for the second annual Great Georgia Pollinator Census. Visit that website as you see on your screen and learn more about being a citizen scientist and participating in the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. You may want to research plants that will be blooming in our area in August. Plant these in your pollinator garden to increase your pollinator population and you will be ready for gardening for the Great Georgia Pollinator Census of 2020. Check this list of 25 garden plants that attract pollinators and find your six to eight that you might want to add to your own pollinator garden. In addition to planting for pollinators, you may be asking what can we do to help our native bee pollinators? Visit online for this publication that gives simple instruction on how to build nesting boxes for native bees, especially the mason bees and leafcutter bees. It has photos and details on the bees that use the types of nests. This is University of Georgia Cooperative Extension booklet and you can find it online at the address on your screen. Here's a picture of some of the bee hotels we built and demonstrated at the Monroe Farmers Market in 2019. To recap, much of the information we covered is from a detailed publication in the Home Garden series from the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension publication B1349, Beyond Butterflies, Gardening for Native Pollinators. Visit the website on the screen to obtain your own copy. We've covered a lot of material today, but if you have questions, please contact us at the Walton County Extension Office in Monroe, Georgia. If you've joined us from another part of the country, please contact your local County Extension Office. Thank you for viewing our video today. We hope you've enjoyed the Gardening with the MGs video and that you now feel comfortable to go outside and enjoy your own garden. Goodbye.